Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Finally, it is time to review AMD's new third generation Ryzen processors. And on hand, we have the Ryzen 9 3900X and the Ryzen 7 3700X. Unfortunately, these are the only two CPUs AMD has sent out to reviewers. So the, the Ryzen 5 processors and the 3800X, well, yeah, who knows how they perform. We'll know shortly, AMD will be sampling them at a later date, but we've just gone out and purchased them. So anyway, at least we've got these two. It's certainly a lot better than nothing. And AMD in their infinite wisdom also decided to lift the review embargo for both Zen 2 and Navi reviews at the same time. But we're going to delay our Navi review uh, for a little bit just so you guys can get the Zen 2 stuff and the videos aren't tripping over each other because we know the YouTube algorithm doesn't particularly like that. And rather than do one video that summarizes both Zen 2 and Navi, we thought we'd just give you all the juicy details on Zen 2 first. But why AMD didn't choose to dominate the news cycle for a few weeks is beyond me, but maybe that's why I don't get paid the big bucks. Anyway, that's just about enough whinging from me. We have a boatload of information to go over. And since I know most of you really just want to see the benchmark results, I'm not going to spend too much time going over specs and pricing. But before we get into anything, Today's video sponsor is NordVPN and right now they're offering Harbour on Box viewers 75% off a three year membership when you use the link in the video description. And that works out to be just $2.99 per month, which in my opinion is a very small price to pay for your internet security, allowing you to browse, download and shop safely. Hardware Unbox gets bombarded with advertising opportunities from VPN services and to date NordVPN is the only company we've worked with and that's for good reason. It's the only service we use and trust. I've tried a number of different services and they all came up short for one reason or another, but I can honestly say NordVPN is the best I've found and having been a customer for well over a year now, I highly recommend you check them out. NordVPN also offers a free 30 day money back guarantee. So start protecting your internet experience today with 75% off a three year plan by using code Harbor Unboxed at nordvpn.com forward slash Harbor Unboxed. Link is in the video description. Okay, so just quickly, the Ryzen 9 3900X is a 12 core, 24 thread processor with a massive 64 megabyte L3 cache. It runs at a base frequency of 3.8 gigahertz with a boost frequency of 4.6 gigahertz. It costs $500 US and that places it in direct competition with the Core i9 9900K. Then as I just said, we also have the Ryzen 7 3700X which costs $330 US and AMD suggests it's taking on the more expensive 9900K with this part. Anyway, it has eight cores, 16 threads with a 32 megabyte L3 cache and clocks anywhere from 3.6 gigahertz to 4.4 gigahertz. Both of these third gen Ryzen CPUs come with the Wraith Prism RGB box cooler, and I'll be using that for the majority of our testing. This does mean Intel will have a slight performance advantage here, but please keep in mind the cost of the cooler will be factored into our value analysis for each processor. That said, I will provide some 3900X and 3700X performance figures using an all-in-one liquid cooler as well. The MSI X570 Creation was used for testing the 3900X and 3700X, while the ASUS ROG Crosshair 7 Hero was used to test the first and second gen Ryzen processors. All have been tested with DDR4 3200CL14 memory, but there will also be some memory scaling benchmarks included in the video, as AMD recommends using DDR4 3600CL16 memory for best results, so we will look into that. As for the 8th and 9th gen Intel Core processors, they were benchmarked on the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Ultra using the same DDR4-3200CL14 memory, but they were cooled using the Corsair Hydro Series H115i RGB Platinum 280mm all-in-one liquid cooler. Please note that the Intel CPUs are not TDP restricted, as that's not the typical out-of-the-box experience, so that means we're showing the absolute best case scenario for out-of-the-box performance. Finally, the graphics card of choice was the MSI Gaming X Trio GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. Okay, I think that covers pretty well everything. Let's get in the benchmark results and maybe grab a drink and some snacks before we get started. Okay, so where better to start than Cinebench R20's multi-threaded benchmark? And oh boy, does the Ryzen 9 3900X look quite mighty here, scoring an incredible 7,086 points, making it 24% faster than the Threadripper 2920X, and that really is incredible. 
Moreover, it completely decimated the 9900K by a 45% margin. The Ryzen 7 3700X was equally impressive. The new 8-core part matched the 9900K, and this meant it was 22% faster than the 2700X and 30% faster than the more expensive 9700K. Needless to say, these new 3rd gen Ryzen parts are already looking like kings of productivity. Now, just to have to say, this one is a rather big deal. Here the 3900X matched the single core performance of the 9900K, and that meant it was 19% faster than the 2700X. The 3700X also did very well, hitting 500 points, and that placed it roughly on par with the 9700K. So this is a massive performance improvement for Ryzen. Here we have some memory bandwidth figures, and this is sustained read-write performance. As I said earlier, all CPUs here are using DDR4-3200CL14 memory, but interestingly the third gen processors are a little down on the first and second gen, but there is a good reason for this, and I will cover that a bit later in the video when we're exploring IPC performance. For now, let's move on to check out a few application benchmarks. As you can see, the changes AMD made with the Zen 2 architecture have had a profound impact on WinRAR performance. The 3700X is unbelievably 84% faster than the 2700X, allowing it to comfortably beat the 8700K and almost match the Core i9-7900X. The 3900X also put on quite the show, though it was only 15% faster than the 3700X and it couldn't quite match the 9900K. Still, overall a remarkable performance uplift here over the second gen parts. Moving on to 7-zip, and first up we have the compression test where traditionally Ryzen hasn't really done that well. For example, you can see how the 2700X is 14% slower than the 9900K. However, all that looks to have changed here with the third iteration of Ryzen, as we see the 3700X easily brushing aside the 9900K by a 15% margin, basically matching the 10-core 7900X. Then we see the 3900X beating the 2920X by an 11% margin, and the 9900K by a whopping 45% margin. So yeah, king of productivity it looks like. I already said that, but damn these productivity results are impressive. Then when it comes to decompression work, 3rd gen Ryzen still enjoys a handy performance advantage. Here the 3700X was 11% faster than the 9900K and a whopping 52% faster than the 9700K. Meanwhile the 3900X was a little over 60% faster than the 9900K and even offered a 17% performance uplift over the Threadripper 2920X. Now, this result really gets me quite excited, if the previous ones haven't already, as I use Premiere on an almost daily basis, and I'm currently doing so with a Threadripper 2950X. Here we see the 3900X is 8% faster than the 2920X, so this means the 3950X will beat the 2950X quite comfortably when it's released in a few months' time. And with that, I can't even imagine what the third gen Threadripper series will be able to deliver. Anyway, here the 3900X was 22% faster than the 9900K, and that's no small performance uplift. In fact, even the 3700X edged out the 9900K, making it 25% faster than the 9700K. And then what makes these results even more impressive is the fact that Premiere is a very pro Intel piece of software. So that is to say it's quite biased towards Intel. AMD's shown the 3900X to be a little over 50% faster than the 9900K in DaVinci Resolve. And yeah, I know, I need to get a DaVinci project sorted out so I can start adding that to our benchmarks and I promise I'll get that done soon. But anyway, the results in Premiere are still very, very impressive. Moving along, first up we have the older 1.0.8 version of the V-Ray benchmark, and I've included this because, well, I had all the data for the previous processors, and I thought, well, might as well just add the third gen processors and show you how they compare. Anyway, using this older version, the 3900X took just 48 seconds to complete the workload, while the 3700X took just 68 seconds. This means although the 3700X was slightly slower, than the 9900K, it was much faster than the 9700K. Meanwhile, the 3900X beat absolutely everything, including the 2920X. 
We also see very similar margins in the newest version of the V-Ray Benchmark, though here the Core i7-7900X does manage to edge ahead of the 2920X. Despite that though, the 3900X easily conquered all, while the 3700X wasn't much slower than the 9900K. So another strong result for AMD. Similar margins are also seen when testing with Corona. The 3900X was 30% faster than the 9900K, while the 3700X was just 10% slower than the Core i9 processor. The 3700X was also 12% faster than the 2700X. Certainly not its most extreme performance uplift over the second gen Ryzen part, but certainly decent all the same. The last application we're going to look at is Blender, and once again we see similar margins between the tested processors, though this time the 3700X is much closer to the 9900K than it is to the 2700X. While running the Blender Open Data Benchmark, I also measured the entire system power draw, so let's check out those results before getting into the gaming benchmarks. Well, would you look at that, the 3700X consumed less power than the 2600X, quite a bit less and even less than the 8700K. In fact, it was comparable to the R5 2600 and 1600 along with the old quad core 7700K. And just as remarkable was the 3900X which was comparable to the 2700X and 7900X making it world more efficient than the 9900K and 2920X. It's pretty crazy when you realize that the 3900X was 41% faster than the 9900K in Blender, and yet it reduced total system consumption by 8%. That really is a stellar result for AMD. And on that high note, I'm going to cautiously move into the gaming benchmarks. Right, so starting with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the new third gen Ryzen processors are around 10% faster than the 2700X, which is quite a good result really, but it's not good enough to beat the 9900K, at least when looking at the average frame rate. Despite similar frame time performance, the 1900K was 4% faster on average at 1080p with an RTX 2080 Ti. I know this is really close enough to call a tie, so let's see what happens at 1440p. Oddly, we don't see a coming together of the results at 1440p like you would expect, but rather the 9900K is now 6% faster than the 3900X, and even more bizarre is the fact that the 2920X is now matching the 3900X. Though to be fair, it wasn't too far behind at 1080p, so perhaps all that extra memory bandwidth is coming in handy at 1440p. Then we see that the 9700K was also 6% faster than the 3700X. Again, not a big margin, but I was hoping to see less of a gap at 1440p. Right, so these results are a little bit disappointing. Well, maybe that's a bit too harsh. After all, the third gen Ryzen parts were both 11% faster than the 2700X, and that is another decent performance gain. The problem is, they're both well down on the 9900K's average and 1% low performance. The 9900K was 8% faster on average and 13% faster when looking at the 1% low result. Again, certainly not a massive margin, but given the slides that we'd seen from AMD, I have to admit I was hoping for more. Still, it is worth noting that at 1440p, the 9900K was just 4% faster than the 3900X, and generally anything within a 5% margin I declare as a draw. So at least under these more typical gaming conditions, there's almost nothing in it. But that still doesn't change the fact that the 9900K is the superior gamer, or at least it is for today's games. Now, here's our biggest deficit yet. This time the 9900K was 17% faster than the 3900X when comparing the average frame rate and 20% faster for the 1% low result. The 3700X did do better relative to the 9700K, but again, gaming still looks to be advantage Intel. Bumping the resolution up to 1440p does reduce the margins quite heavily, and now the 9900K was just 8% faster for the average frame rate, and this is certainly a more realistic resolution for an RTX 2080 Ti. I have to admit, I was hoping these third gen Ryzen processors would be a little more punchy in the Division 2, but don't get me wrong, the gameplay was still incredibly smooth, but even so, the 9900K was still 11% faster than the 3900X. But with similar 1% low performance, the Ryzen processors really were smooth operators. Then as we move to 1440p, 
as you'd probably expect in this game, we're now entirely GPU bound with these higher end CPUs. And this allowed the 9900K, 9700K, 3700X and 3900X to all deliver identical performance. Next up we have Far Cry New Dawn and this title along with previous installments in this series have always been troublesome for AMD Ryzen processors. Here we see the 2700X allowing for just 98 FPS on average and that made the 9900K 26% faster. The new third gen Ryzen parts don't completely solve this issue but they do dramatically push things in the right direction for AMD. And as a result we see that the 9900K is now just 10% faster than both the 3900X and 3700X. Then at 1440p, the margin is reduced even further, as you'd probably expect, and now it's just the 1% low results that noticeably favor the Intel 8 core processors. The deficit seen in Far Cry New Dawn was a little disappointing, and the same can be said when discussing the World War Z results. In fact, this is by far the most disappointing result we've seen, and that's because the 3rd gen Ryzen processors are no faster than the 2700X. This means the 9900K was 18% faster than the 3900X, and the 9700K was 21% faster than the 3700X. So whatever it is that past Ryzen processors don't like about World War Z, this latest generation isn't able to address. Even at the more GPU limited 1440p, the 9900K was still able to beat the 3900X by a 9% margin, so again, not an ideal result for AMD. Moving on, we have some Rage 2 results, and here the 3900X and 3700X do perform very well, offering slightly better 1% low performance than the 2700X, which puts them on par with the 8700K. Having said all that though, we do see that the 9900K and 9700K offer slightly better 1% low performance, around 7% better. Not really a big deal here, and as you might expect, the gaming experience was virtually identical. Then at 1440p, we're entirely GPU bound with these higher end CPUs. From the 3700X up, we're able to get the most out of the RTX 2080 Ti. Hitman 2 is another one of those titles that's never been that friendly with AMD Ryzen processors, and we see that it's still an issue for the third gen parts. Here the 9900K beat the 3900X by a 15% margin, though that's nothing like the 27% margin it beats the 2700X by, so there is that. Once again, the margins at 1440p are heavily reduced, and now the 9900K is just 5% faster than the 3900X. The 3700X was still 9% faster than the 2700X, so the third gen Ryzen series have really made a good step forward here when it comes to gaming. Finally, the last game that we're going to look at is Total War 3 Kingdoms, and this is a solid result for AMD. The 3700X was able to improve the 1% low performance of the 2700X by an 8% margin, making it just 1% slower than the 9900K, and 5% slower than the 9700K, which actually does a little bit better in this title without hyper-threading. Then at 1440p, we're once again almost entirely GPU bound, leaving just a frame or two in it at the most. So I think that's a pretty good spot to wrap up the gaming benchmarks, and I think we'll move on to take a quick look at some memory scaling, or at least how DDR4 3200 and 3600 compare. DDR4 3600 is the fastest memory spec AMD recommends using with third gen Ryzen CPUs, as higher clocked memory will actually reduce performance, at least when clocked higher than 3733, as this changes the Infinity Fabric to a 2 to 1 mode rather than a 1 to 1 mode. Basically 2 to 1 sees the Infinity Fabric clocked at a quarter of the memory speed, while 1 to 1 is half. Since AMD did recommend DDR4-3600 memory for optimal performance and provided reviewers with a CL16 kit, I thought I'd better test it out, just to make sure we're not hampering performance by using the CL14-3200 kit. The good news is we're not, here you'll see virtually identical performance in Corona, WinRAR, Far Cry New Dawn, Assassin's Creed Odyssey and World War Z. Unfortunately due to time I didn't get a whole lot of memory testing done, but this is something I will follow up with providing a much more detailed video in the near future. At the request of many of our Patreon members, I also took a quick look at chipset performance, comparing B450 to X570, using the MSI B450 Tomahawk and X570 creation. I didn't include an X470 board, again due to time, and given we know B450 and X470 boards deliver the same performance, 
you should be able to fill in the gaps pretty easily there. Looking at the Cinebench scores, there appears to be a slight performance advantage in favor of the X570 board, but we're only talking a 1% difference, which is within the margin of error, though the results did always favor the X570 board when taking an average of three runs. Enabling PBO plus Auto OC in the Ryzen Master, we again see similar performance on the X570 and B450 boards. And as claimed by AMD, the PBO feature of the third gen Ryzen processors can be enabled on all motherboards that support these processors. And just lastly, a quick look at gaming performance with World War Z, and again, very similar performance on both boards. I will have a much more in-depth video soon looking at B350 and X370 motherboards, but given the time I had allocated for this review, we're going to have to settle with the B450 versus X570 comparison. Moving on, we have some IPC testing, and for this I've clocked the 9900K, 3700X, 2700X, and 1700X at 4GHz using the same DDR4 3200CL14 memory. The results, I have to say, are quite staggering. Whereas clock for clock, the 2700X is 4% slower than the 9900K, the 3700X is 13% faster. I don't really know what to say about that. It's a pretty amazing result. So I guess there you have it. AMD certainly weren't stretching the truth when they claimed a 15% improvement in IPC over second gen Ryzen. Here we're seeing an 18% improvement. Interestingly though, we do only see an 11% boost in single core performance, but even so that's still a massive generational jump. And that means the 3700X was still 7% faster than the 9900K when matched clock for clock. Despite the mind blowing Cinebench results, the 9900K is still able to show these young feisty Ryzen processors who's boss when it comes to gaming. Clock for clock, the 9900K was still 10% faster than the 3700X. However, perhaps more shocking is the fact that in this particular title, the 3700X was just 2% faster than the 2700X. I guess this explains why the results in this particular title and others such as Far Cry New Dawn were a little more disappointing than we were hoping for. Still, we do see quite a different story when testing with Battlefield 5, at least when comparing the second and third gen Ryzen processors. Here the 3700X provided an 8% performance boost over the 2700X when both were locked at the same 4 GHz frequency. Despite that though, the 9900K was still 7% faster than the 3700X. So why is that? Well, once again, a big part of the issue is core to core latency. But the good news is AMD's made massive strides forward in this area, taking core to core latency from around 81 nanoseconds down to just 56 nanoseconds, and that's a 30% reduction in latency. This also means core to core communication is just 11% slower when compared to the 9900K, and that's a big part of why we're seeing third gen Ryzen close in on the 9900K's gaming performance, but also why it's still not quite there yet. Also, just lastly, something that seemed a bit odd at first when I discovered it is the memory write performance of third gen Ryzen. It's significantly down on the first and second gen parts. AMD's made a compromise here as client workloads do very little writing. So rather than use this space to improve something that isn't really going to boost performance overall, they've invested this silicon real estate in more beneficial ways to achieve tangible performance gains. So whereas the core complex die to IO die link for reading memory is 32 bytes wide, it's only 16 bytes wide for writing, and this is why the peak write bandwidth is effectively cut in half. Now, time for the overclocking results, and again, due to limited time, I didn't do as much testing here as I would have liked, but it seems pretty clear that just like the first and second gen Ryzen CPUs, there's very little overclocking headroom to speak of with these third gen Ryzen processors. And this really isn't that surprising. Both AMD and Intel locked in a fierce battle which sees both trying to extract the maximum amount of performance they can from these high-end CPUs. At best, I was able to boost the 3900X's multi-core score by 4%, while the 3700X saw a 6% increase. However, as was the case with second gen Ryzen, the simple multiplier OC method that I used for the 4.3 GHz all-core overclock is not really the method you want to be using. Here we see when looking at the single core results, it does reduce performance, leaving PBO overclocking as the most effective method overall. Still, I feel that most won't bother overclocking to extract that extra 4 to 6% performance, and from what I've heard from other reviewers, 4.3 GHz seems to be one of the better overclocks, at least for the 3900X. 
On an even more disappointing note, I somehow managed to end the life of my 3900X. There's really no delicate way to say it. Uh, at this stage of the review, yeah, I managed to kill my Ryzen 9 3900X processor. I'm not sure exactly what settings were applied. I know I hadn't got into manually adjusting the voltage yet. I was letting the board handle it. I'm not going to specify which board it was because these were very early BIOSes that, yeah, well, they were review BIOSes that hadn't been fully validated. Anyway, I believe I was, well, after testing 4.3 gigahertz, I decided to, again, leave the voltage on auto and then increase the LLC to see if I could... Uh, well, see what impact that had on temperatures and stuff like that. I was just messing around. It was very, very late at night. I wasn't fully paying attention to what I was doing, but I certainly, certainly never expected to kill the processor. I, in all my years, never, ever run into a problem like this. Anyway, booted up into Windows. Uh, I wasn't really voltage monitoring, so maybe my bad. Anyway, I only ran a Cinebench 20 pass, a multi-core uh, pass, which doesn't run for particularly long time. Anyway, it crashed about halfway through, reset the system, and sadly, it never booted up again. The CPU now gets stuck at code 07, which is AP initialization after microcode. I tried another completely different X570 board from a different brand, so yeah, completely different board, and I got the exact same postcode error. Then after trying the B450 Tomahawk, once that was flashed up and working with the 3700X, I tried the 3900X and yeah, sadly, it was, it was declared completely dead at that point, did not boot up at all. AMD assures me that no other reviewers have managed to kill their 3900X, so I guess I'm just special or unlucky. I'll let you guys pick on that one. AMD has sent me a replacement, but unfortunately it hasn't arrived in time for me to update any of the testing that I didn't get done, obviously, in this review. That'll be arriving, well, tomorrow, so Monday, and then I can get on with a few more tests I want to do, like try the 3900X on B450 motherboards, uh, add it to our IPC testing so we can see how two chiplets uh, impact the results there. But anyway, that's what happened. So extremely unfortunate in all my years, never ever had this problem, but obviously CPUs do have a defective rate as small as it is. So maybe it wasn't anything to do with the early biases. It was just, just a bad chip. Unfortunately, the death of my 3900X also means I don't have any temperature data at all. So for this, we're just gonna have to settle for what I've been able to collect with the 3700X. Basically with the Wraith Prism RGB box cooler, you can get pretty close to extracting maximum performance out of the 3700X, though it does get a little toasty, but on the bright side, the cooler is very quiet. So 87 degrees for the overclock is very respectable. Of course, if you are going to overclock, I recommend an aftermarket cooler. You certainly don't need something as expensive as the Corsair Hydro Series H115i, but that's what I had available for testing. And as you can see, after an hour-long blender stress test, the 3700X peaked at just 73 degrees. It's a shame I don't have the 3900X results, but I suspect with the box cooler, it runs at around 80 degrees stock under heavy load. Of course, all the results for the 3900X seen in this video were recorded with the box cooler, as I noted earlier. Okay, so we've now seen how these new third gen Ryzen processors perform. It's time to work out if you should actually buy them and what do they offer in terms of value. So let's move on to do that. Looking at the current asking prices, you're paying quite a premium for these new CPUs when compared to the second gen parts, but that's really hardly surprising. When compared to the Intel competition, purely for gaming, the 3700X is on par with the 9700K and 8700K in terms of value. The 3900X doesn't stack up quite as well here, and this means the 9900K is actually quite a bit better in terms of value. Or is it? While the 3900X comes with a box cooler, none of the Intel k SKU parts do. So let's add in the cost of a good air cooler and then recalculate the cost per frame. When I asked on Twitter, most of you seem to agree that the Be Quiet Dark Rock 4 for $75 was a reasonable pairing for the 9900K and 9700K. So I've added that to the budget for the K processors. Factoring in the cooler means the 3900X is now better value than the 9900K and the 3700X is very similar to the Core i5 9600K. Motherboard costs are much the same really, so it's just the cooler that those considering Intel need to account for. 
As for AMD's second and first gen Ryzen processors, well, they're bloody cheap these days, so it makes it hard to compare them with these new third gen Ryzen parts. Still, the 3700X costs just 14% more per frame than the 2700X, and given the massive power savings and improvement in single and lightly threaded workloads, I think it's well worth that premium. So it'll be interesting to see how the Ryzen 5 3600 stacks up against the R5 2600 and 1600 when I test it in a few days time. Moving on from gaming, let's take a quick look at a few applications, starting with Blender. On this scatter graph, you ideally want to be as low as possible and as far to the right as possible. As you can see, the 3700X is not only much lower on the graph than the 9700K, but it's also much further to the right, indicating significantly better price to performance. The 3900X is also significantly lower than the 9900K, but much more to the right as it's significantly more affordable and much faster. We see a similar story in Premiere. The competing AMD processors are all situated lower on the graph and further to the right, making them not just more affordable, but also faster. Okay, so despite the fact that I've already blurted out over 4,000 words and we're over 50 graphs deep into this review, I feel like there is a lot more that I would like to cover. And I guess that's partly because my 3900X testing was cut so short. Nevertheless, we have covered all the essentials in this review, and you should now have a pretty good idea of how the Ryzen 9 3900X and Ryzen 7 3700X compare to the current generation Intel CPUs. I also have a very, very nice looking range of X570 motherboards that I've been checking out over the past week, but I'll save getting into all those until a little bit later on. For now, just enjoy the B-roll shots. Likewise, I have a few really impressive PCIe Gen 4 SSDs, but again, I'll save that testing for a future video. But as I said, the X570 boards are really nice and so are the high-speed SSDs, but truth be told, neither are required to get the most out of these new third-gen Ryzen processors. Rather, I feel they just complement them at the high end. So suitable for your 3900X, for example. And that being the case, I feel for the most part, the X570 boards, particularly the more premium models, should only be paired with the 3900X or the upcoming 3950X. For those grabbing the 3700X and especially the more affordable Ryzen 5 3600 models, I'd recommend existing X470 and B450 motherboards. And my personal preference right now is either the MSI B450 Tomahawk or the Gaming Carbon Pro AC. And if you want to know more about those boards, then check out our B450 VRM thermal testing video. I have to say, I've noticed a lot of commotion regarding these X570 motherboards, namely their pricing, but it really doesn't matter given that you can fully unleash these Zen 2 processors on B450 motherboards and probably even B350 boards, and I'll set about testing that shortly. As for PCIe Gen 4 SSDs, yeah, look, they're really nice, but again, truth is for gaming and general usage, they're not worth paying a premium for. There's a good chance you won't even notice the difference over existing PCIe Gen 3 models, so bear that in mind. But of course, for those of you who need that extra bandwidth for whatever reason, you're probably better off waiting for Threadripper, as it'll offer many more PCIe lanes and likely be more useful in that regard. Okay, so let's talk about the gaming results, as I suspect these will be causing the greatest stir in the comment section below. Annoyingly, AMD did lead us to believe that the 3900X and 9900K would be neck and neck, trade blows even, but that doesn't appear to be the case. The end result though is far from bad, and third gen Ryzen has generally shown a really big step forward for AMD. Moreover, under realistic gaming conditions, there's almost no chance you'd be able to tell the difference between the 9900K, the 3900X, or the 3700X, as the difference at 1440p with an RTX 2080 Ti was incredibly small. After all, the 3900X was just 8% slower on average at 1080p, so AMD's basically halved the deficit to Intel in gaming, and it was already questionable as to how much of a difference it really made. Then, as we found previously with Ryzen, for almost anything outside of gaming, the 3900X buries the 9900K, while the 3700X delivers comparable performance. But this time, when it comes to power consumption, the new third gen Ryzen processors are extremely efficient and head and shoulders above Intel's ninth gen parts. 
So if you're just interested in gaming performance, I'd recommend the 3700X and probably the six core 3600 models. And as I said, I'll cover those soon. But if for whatever reason you want the absolute fastest gaming CPU, then that's still either Intel's 9700K or 9900K. But value for money, they really aren't great at the moment and there is no upgrade path. And like I said, for most gaming scenarios, the difference won't be realized. In my opinion, Intel really needs to cut pricing and I'm not sure a 15% price drop will be enough. Now, for those of you who use your PC for work, so perhaps you game on your PC, but you also use it for productivity, much like myself, and maybe for content creation or, well, really any other heavy productivity task, well, then these new Ryzen CPUs are really in a league of their own, and this makes the 9900K a bit of a one-trick pony now. Overall, the new Ryzen 3000 series is everything I hoped it would be. It's a big step forward from the 2000 series, and the improvements in power efficiency are nothing short of amazing. I'm really pleased with the pricing. Surely no one can complain with what AMD is offering at these price points. And if this doesn't force Intel to adjust their pricing, I'm pretty confident nothing will. And that is going to do it for this one. There is much more testing to come, so don't worry about that. We'll have plenty more testing over the next few days. And then of course, later today, tomorrow, depending on where you're situated in the world, we will have our in-depth Navi coverage as well. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. And of course, if you did like this video, then please feel free to give it a like. You can drop a comment below and let us know what you think about AMD's new Ryzen processors. Very keen to hear what you guys think. I reckon there'll be a bit of a discussion around the gaming performance. Also, you can join us over on Patreon for a few cool perks, such as access to our exclusive Discord server and then our monthly live stream. Tim and I will be doing that in about a week's time. And there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff there uh, that will be discussed, including my 3900X that unfortunately died. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.